Father God, thank you, Lord, for uh, this day. It's been a great day. Thank you for my friends here today, my brothers and sisters. Uh, I pray that our minds would be open, our hearts would be uh, in tune to you. Take anything that would distract and put it aside right now, Lord. It's not because of me, it's because of your word um, and the promises in it. May we uh, learn and may we uh, take what we learn and may we live it. In your son's name we pray, amen. So, we are coming to the close of the book of Philippians. Uh, it's another one of those particular books where every, you know, when you ask people, what is your favorite book in the Bible? Usually Philippians is in the top five. It's like everybody likes Philippians. It is an amazing book. And Paul has an amazing relationship with this church body who really love him. And I think that sometimes we can get um, an idea of how we as a church can even support our missionaries and support those that we, we send out because they really cared about him. And so if you're there, uh, I'd like to read to you 10 through 13. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So Paul starts to, uh, as he ends his letter to the church at Philippi, he ends with a personal note of gratitude, but it's typical of a lot of Paul's writings, even something as simple as a thank you can be very profound. And so he's thanking the church, his good friends, for their persistent search for him. Because as we notice that, you know, during Paul's travels and, every, and everything, they probably separated at some time. They, they lost track of him. Certainly when he was on his long boat ride to Rome, they might have, or his two years in Caesarea. But they finally discovered his whereabouts in Rome, and they have sent Epaphroditus his way. And so he's excited about this relationship. And then he jumps into this whole thing about contentment. But uh, the, the fact is, I'm really glad you found me, and I'm glad this relationship is renewed. But uh, I want you to know that, regardless, I have learned to be content in every situation. And I want to read this verse, these two verses here, because I think they are the, the nexus. They are, they are um, an amazing passage that we have to grapple with, and we have to understand uh, how to have contentment and what that means, particularly in today's world, because we struggle with this a great deal. So verses 11 and 12. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Now, I'm kind of a musical person. Um, those that work with me in the office know that rarely does a day go by that I'm not singing in the hallways or making noise. Part of that is being an only child, and I had to entertain myself as a child often, and so I was constantly making noise. And I like music a great deal. And I associate, as perhaps you do, certain seasons of my life with certain songs. And so, um, for instance, when I did high school ministry for 17 years here, um, we had our grad banquet at the end of the year, and at one of our grad banquets, we had two of our gals, Kelly Robinson and Sarah Olgavia, and they were in the class of 1996, and they sang the song, Friends Are Friends Forever, by Michael W. Smith, and I, whenever I hear that song, I think of Sarah, and I think of Kelly, and I think of that grad banquet, and we were, there was crying going around, gnashing of teeth, and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Well, not gnashing of teeth, but they were crying. And, but I'll always associate that song with the graduating class of 1996. Going back into ancient history, and those of you who are over 45 will, will get this. So when I was in high school, my senior year, I associate my senior year with a song by Simon and Garfunkel, Bridge Over Troubled Waters. And you know, the reason I associate so much of it is because my senior year was very troubled. And so somehow that song gravitates to me. Now, this next song 
was in seventh grade. By the way, first of all, I love junior hires, but in the 27 years I did high school ministry, youth ministry, I always made sure that the first group I delegated somebody else to work with, it was junior high. And nothing against junior high, but I just, you know, I just, I realized that my junior high years, they were just a mess, and so I didn't want to work with a mess. So, um, <laughs> I don't mean that. I, Anyway, so this one song in seventh grade, and I don't know, I was in a progressive high school because during the passing periods, they'd play music. And so this is the song that I remember from seventh grade and all the angst I had in seventh grade. The Rolling Stones, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. <laughs> but we try and we try and we try and we try, and a no, 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 I can't get no. Anyway, I associate all those things. And the reason I bring those up is because we're going to associate a song with contentment now. I'm going to have Tyler and Brianna, two of amazing young adults, going to come up and uh, sing this for us. Are you guys ready? I don't think you guys are ready. Cheer! Let's go! This may not be what you're used to, but sometimes God speaks in amazing ways, so I pray you open up your heart. Cheer. I'm reaching now, won't you grab my hand? You've given me everything I need, Lord, but still I ran away from grace, chasing things that are so monetary. I'm caught up in this race, God, my banks, my monastery, and I've been so focused on keeping up with the Joneses that I have failed to notice it gives you place beneath my nose, money causing the clothes. Nothing's ever enough There's a fight between me and this earth, Lord And I'm messing up my mind, spinning so fast Trying to get cash even though it won't last Everybody telling me, go to God if I really got a need And I think about my greed and I won't ask Cause First Timothy chapter 6, verse 7 I may get all these possessions, but I can't take them to heaven uh, So I pray you clean my heart of these ungodly endeavors But we know you will provide until I reign with you forever Forever, what a beautiful word Just place that image in my mind if I swerve Cheer. Only you can keep me content Only you, God Help me to remember you are more than enough for me More than enough I'm coming to you now, Lord, a bit ashamed I've been jealous of the ones around me Let me explain, I've been coveting my neighbor's house My neighbor's wife, I've been coveting everything Let there be light on this boundary that you presented I don't deserve a crumb Still you're bringing me to heaven You gave me bread when I was hungry Water when I needed drink A beautiful angel to honor And this air to breathe Above all that you gave me grace, Lord And that's enough That unconditional love is all I should ever want So when I look upon that cross Won't you remind me You gave up everything to save us Till sometimes we Rookers on them earthly things So irrelevant Let me look at my life, Lord let me be content. I learned in those circumstances only you can keep me content. Only you, God. Help me to remember you are more than enough for me. You're more than enough. To God, I pray that you open up our eyes. And see the things that you have given us, your love, your grace, your son. I pray that you take the focus off the things that we want or the things that we think we need, Lord. We can't get no satisfaction through those things, Lord. Only through you. Amen. So many times in life... We look and see, hey, I want that, I want that car, I want that new job, I want that new shirt. Trying to feel that hole inside of us, but it never gets filled. And there's only one true thing that fills that hole, and that's God, and that's His grace and His love. So I want to challenge you guys today when you walk out of here. I want you guys to look at the things that, that God has given you, the things that we take for granted every day. The fact that we woke up, the fact that we have bread on the table. Look at those things and know that we don't deserve any of it. But still, God has chosen to give it to us. 
pray that we look at those things and be content. kind of getting my groove on back there a little bit. I don't know, I don't know what that means. Uh, that's a song about contentment, satisfaction. Paul got it. He understood. He understood what satisfaction. He learned whatever situation he was in, whether abounding or lacking, facing plenty or in need, to be content. And let's start off right here, recognizing that sometimes we think, well, I'll be content if I have certain things, and then we get those things. We're still not content. The trials of contentment, you can have nothing, and you can have a lot, and you can still have the same trials. We were just in New York City with some of our college students, and we saw the contrasts in lifestyles. We saw the contrasts in the haves and the have-nots, and often it was the ones that didn't have a lot that had a lot more joy in their lives than the ones that did. And our students, uh, they learn what I can't teach in a hundred Sunday school lessons about thankfulness, about understanding. It's not about our provisions. It's not, it's not about all the stuff. It's really about this relationship with Christ, and it's about what He has done for us. And He will provide. He will provide. Only God, only Jesus could have given Paul the contentment to sing at midnight in a filthy, rat-infested prison with his feet in stalks and his back bloodied. Only God can give that. Over the years, men and women have died for the faith and have gone to the Lord, and during that time, God has used them in amazing ways as they've sang songs of praise to him before, before they died. Paul appreciates the gifts from Philippi, but he's not ultimately dependent on them. He has learned contentment. Now, as we look into this journey, and it is a journey of faith, that Learning contentment isn't easy, and it takes a while. And even during Paul's journey, uh, he had to learn this. And I want to admit to you, uh, being really honest to you, and, and when I, uh, I knew this series was going on a long time ago, and I asked both the, both the bills, and I think we got a bunch of bills on staff, so there's a bunch of bills, and I asked them if I could preach this because I have struggled my whole adult Christian life with contentment. It has been a struggle for me. I have compared myself to others. I have had a sense of entitlement. And uh, mixed with that, there has been a, a sense of uh, disgratitude where I just haven't been thankful to the Lord. I'm not proud of that. I'm ashamed to admit it. And it's not been an easy journey for me. And I knew that if God would enter me into this passage and I'd spend some time that he would teach me some things. And I think that some of you might be there as well. So let's see what God wants to teach us here as we go through this. First of all, contentment does not come naturally. We know that the first thing you're born is we have children. They're not instantly content. We know one of the first words out of a child's mouth is the word no, or mine, and they incessantly say it. We have this problem with our kids as they grow up that they complain about things, they whine about things, they're not contented, they compare themselves to their friends who have more. The world doesn't help with that. Even as a child, I would count my Christmas presents. Now, I was an only child. <laughs> I'm still an only child, as far as I know. You know, and I would count my, I would count my Christmas presents and I would let, this is, I hate to admit this, I'd let my parents know if my quota wasn't met from the following year. So if I had 13 under the, uh, yeah, I know a couple of you are already nodding your head. It's really bad. And so in the next year, I'd expect at least 13 and maybe 14. And my dad was a mail carrier, so he wasn't rich. We weren't rich or anything. And, but I was not. I was a spoiled child. Contented I wasn't. J.C. Ryle wrote this. He said, two things are said to be very rare sights in this world. One is a young man that is humble, and the other is an old man that is content. Since I'm somewhat in the middle, I struggle with both, both contentment and being humble. Let's face it, our world breeds discontentment in us. We are bombarded by advertisements 
tells us that we're incomplete or unfulfilled. You don't have to watch TV more than 15 minutes to get a several ads on being more complete, being all that you can be, changing your figure, changing everything about you. And we're bombarded with this. We have, we have home shopping network, networks. We have eBay. We have glitzy, well-done commercials. When we walked down Fifth Avenue, as we saw, we were in Times Square with our team. We are looking up at all these amazing advertisements, all pleading for you to buy their product, recognize your lack, and then supply the need for you. The advertising industry spends $250 billion a year. They stimulate in us a discontent state by continually convincing us that more and better is desirable. John Calvin said this, they appeal to the sinful heart, which is already a discontented, idol-making factory. We have to be very careful here. Let me ask you a question, and I did this the last time I preached too, and it's kind of, kind of what I do. Uh, I'm going to ask you to fill in a blank, and I'm not going to ask you to reply out loud. It's, it is kind of audience participation. And if it applies to you, just kind of note it. I'm going to say, I will be content when, and I will fill that in. And if you kind of go and go, that, that's kind of me, or where I was, or where maybe I am. So let's try it. I will be content when I'm promoted. I will be content when I'm in shape. I'll be content when I'm married. I'll be content when I'm completely healthy. I'll be content when my kids are doing well. I'll be content when I'm making a certain amount of money. We have a lot of different things that we put out there. As I, if only I had this, I will be content. The thing that we have to understand is that contentment is learned. In fact, in verse 11, the word Paul uses for I have learned is myo, which can also mean to be initiated into a secret. He has learned the secret of contentment. And we're going to stretch this a little bit, and we'll see what that is in just a moment. But I want to talk about three particular enemies of contentment. And we see them throughout Scripture as well. And they fall off the tree of self. The first is comparing ourselves to others. Comparing ourselves to us, others. Do you ever do that? Do you ever compare yourself to somebody else? And it, and it, can, be, it can be very subtle. It can be uh, like, oh, I just wish I had his gift or I wish I could sing like her, or I wish I could do this. As a young youth pastor, I used to bring young people from Arizona to Yume Lake. We would get on the bus at 11 o'clock at night. We'd go all night. We'd get to Yume Lake. We'd have uh, lunch before we got there in Merced or something, go up to Yume Lake. We'd be at Yume Lake for a week. We started off, when I first started there, I was just a young youth pastor. And at first, when I was there, I was always impressed, silly, with the youth speakers, because they were amazing. So I started coveting their gifts. Oh, if I could only speak like him. And then I started coveting the other youth pastors that had more kids. And then when I became the youth pastor with the most, most kids, I became proud. I was a mess. My last year that we were there, we took five busloads of high schoolers. We had 250 high schoolers up there out of 700, and I was a mess comparing. One of my favorite passages is, is this brief interlude between Jesus and, and uh, Peter. It's in John 21. Jesus had just restored Peter, Peter's position with him, commissioning him to take care of my sheep. You probably recall it. He says it three times, will you take care of my sheep? Peter gets a little annoyed. Okay, I said I will, I will, I will. And then he goes from there and he, he prophesizes about the kind of death Peter will die. And Peter asks them, as they're walking along, you can kind of envision the scene, and what about him? He's talking about John. What's going to happen to him? Jesus answers, what is that to you? Essentially, he was saying, Peter, that, that's not your concern. I'm in control here. Stop looking at John. Keep your eyes fixed on me. Let's not get embittered about our status and position. We need to stop comparing ourselves to others. It is insidious, and we do it in subtle and not so subtle ways. Wishing we were them, wishing we had their stuff, wishing we had their gifts. The next enemy is a sense of entitlement. Sense of entitlement is a cancerous thought process and a bad cousin of comparisons. It's completely void of thanksgiving. 
and it can be deadly to relationship. Essentially, it says this. It says, I'm owed this. Position, status, or maybe more money. The sense of entitlement is how we think our lives, our close relationships, our work, our resources should be. We think we know what we must have to be grateful and happy. We also think we're owed a comfortable, easy life, especially since we're good people, or we're God's people. Actually, when you read Scripture, the way of Christ isn't easy. We're to take up our crosses daily and follow him. You look at the legion of men and women whose life are on, lives are on the line on a daily basis throughout the world. Look at all the men and women who have died for their faith. One of the most profound experiences I ever had was on a mission trip to Brazil a number of years ago with some high school students. At the end of our Sunday service, the, the pastor said that they had some houses that they wanted to have the students go to so they could have lunch and the families were inviting them in. So we split our group into three groups, and we took a bus. We went to each one of those houses. So my group, we went to this house, this man and woman and their five children who were at the church service, and we met and were the nicest people, went to their house. It was right next to a sewage area. Their roof was corrugated skin, uh, um, steel, and there were gaps in the roof. Their, their, uh, their flooring was dirt mixed with concrete, there was virtually no privacy, and it smelled. And yet, this couple, this family, was amazingly content. They were amazingly joyful about their life in Christ. They, they kept talking about what Jesus had done in their lives and how he had changed their lives and how he had changed their dispositions and how just one thing after another. Now, I couldn't teach that Sunday school lesson in a thousand Sunday school lessons with high schoolers. They came back with a couple of things. One, it's not about possessions that makes me joyful. It's about this relationship with Jesus Christ. He'll provide for me. And secondly, they were thankful. And I got thanks from several of the parents saying, oh my gosh, my kids got home. They made their beds, first of all. And second of all, they said, thank you. And it's like I hadn't heard that in a while. And it was amazing. The sense of entitlement is crazy. It's our, it's in essence, we say to God, not your way, but my way. This is what I need. And I need this now. Or I need this to make up for what I haven't had in the past. This is sin. And this sense of entitlement eats, uh, leads very easily to the third one, and that's complaining. We all complain. Early in the series in Philippians 2, uh, we read about this, 2.14. It says, do all things without grumbling and disputing. Uh, grumbling could be translated murmuring or muttering, an inward argument. You know, that type of thing. Um, so I just did a wedding yesterday in the, uh, the Delta area. And if you know Freeport and the Delta area and stuff, the roads are kind of, you know, just two ways. And they're kind of slow and you're long side. And you can't go very fast. So I'm headed to this wedding. And uh, this car's in front of me. And they're going really, really slow. And I didn't want to go that slow. And so I'm kind of like envisioning in my mind, I'm going, I, I, I hate to admit this, I'm stereotyping and thinking about exactly who this is driving uh, and uh, buying all those stereotypes. And I'm complaining and I'm being like, oh my gosh, I, mean, I think the, the sign says we can go like 35 miles an hour. They're going maybe 20, 25. This is crazy. I don't know. I wasn't in a hurry. I was there plenty of time, but I was complaining. In the midst of that complaining, my mind suddenly goes to, oh, I'm preaching tomorrow about complaining. I think that's in it somewhere. <laughs> so God got my attention. Oh, okay, this is one of the points that I'm talking about is complaining, and that's what you're doing here really easily. Have you ever noticed that when you drive sometimes you love to complain about other people? Oh, my gosh, they drive too fast. They drive too slow. They don't put their blinkers on. You know, that, that, you know, they have their cell phones. Whatever. We complain incessantly. I worked at a restaurant. I used to go there in, in my college. I just came to know Christ. And I'd go to this restaurant, and I'd go in there, and all the employees, that's all they'd do was complain. That was, was a new creation in Christ, and, and God is working some amazing things in me, and it was him doing it because it wasn't me. And I was kind of joyful, and I was kind of smiling and happy. And after a while, these the fellow employees, they, were just, they didn't know what to do with me. It's kind of like, oh, why don't you join us about this? And then God gave me some opportunities at, at the duration that I worked there. People would say, what is this about you? You're not complaining. You're not getting involved in all this. And I said, well, 
I, it can't be me, it must be God. And so I had opportunities to share. Complaining is terrible. You remember when the Israelites went out of Egypt, God provided all the way for them. Do you remember that? And that all the way they complained and they complained? Well, in Numbers 11, chapter 11, verses 4 through 6, this is what it says. It says, Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. I don't know if they didn't also remember that the lashes that they received, the servitude that they were in, and that it, maybe you remember the Lord's response to the people complaining. He was angry. He was angry. You see, we love to complain. And somehow, in order for us to continue to grow in our faith, we have to get a handle on that. And there are two particular antidotes to this that I think that will help us with that. To be content, you must be thankful. In fact, it's hard to be discontented and thankful at the same time. Acts 17.25, Paul told his audience at Athens that God himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Everything comes from God. But how often do you and I often stop to thank him? Besides the cursory prayer that we say at our meals, which I'm not putting down, you might be very earnest in them, that's great. But how often do we thank him for what he has given us? How many of you, when you get done at a work day, when you leave your jobs, you thank him for your profession or your job, that you have one? Thank God, the Father, that he gives you the skill and the ability and the health to do your work today. Have you ever gone physically or mentally through your house, look at your furnishings and various items of home decoration and say to God, everything in the house and the food in the fridge and the car or the cars in the driveway are gifts, gifts from you. Thank you for your gracious and generous provision. And if you're still a student, do you ever give thanks to God for the intellectual ability and the financial provision that makes it possible for you to prepare for your future? vocation? Do you thank God for your spouse? Do you thank God for your children? Do you thank God for your parents? Do you thank God for your jobs? Do you thank God for your neighbors? Do you thank God for your health? There's so many things, and yet we live in a society that we are nurtured by the world to not give thanks, but to want more, or to recognize what we don't have, and think that in order to be whole or complete, we need those things. Ephesians 5.20, we're told to give thanks always and for everything to God. You can underline those words. I don't think they mean anything else besides always and everything. Psalm 147.7 says, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. 1 Corinthians 15.56 says, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's conquered death, and he's brought us life. That's worthy of thanksgiving. Colossians 2, 6, and 7. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in what? Thanksgiving. It could go on and on and on. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, Paul writes, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We are even to give thanks for the difficult things in life, for the trials. As I've gotten older uh, in ministry, at first uh, I was doing a lot of weddings, still do a lot of weddings, but now I'm also doing a few more funerals and memorials and uh, been dealing with a couple of situations, not too, um, just fairly recently. And one of the amazing ladies that I'm with is how much, as her life is coming to an end, how much she is just thankful for everything. She's thankful for everything. She's taught me a lot about contentment as well. The next antidote, and really it is the source of our contentment, is God himself. And contentment is possible because of the work of Jesus Christ. Think about it. God's goodness and Jesus' incarnation, his left, his life, death, and resurrection are the source of Paul's contentment and should be of ours. Without this foundation, our contentment risks being shallow. 
certainly temporary and rooted in uncertain circumstances, but when we recognize who we have in Christ, what He has done for us, and what He promises us, we should be content. Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Max Lucado, popular author, said this about that particular psalm. He said, David has found the pasture where discontentment goes to die. It's as if he is saying, what I have in God, what I have in God is greater than what I don't have in life. It's very profound. What I have in God is greater than what I don't have in life. Now let's go to the last verse in our study. It's one of my favorite verses. We all know this one. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Sometimes this verse is taken out of context. Sometimes it's used as a motivational self-help verse. Uh, I can definitely tell you what it doesn't mean. I probably won't be the next one to win America's Got Talent uh, or The Voice, um, even with God. Um, some take it to mean there is nothing a Christian cannot do. Um, I think in the context here, Paul is referring, and it fits this passage, is that God's empowering his people to acquire an important Christian virtue, namely being content. So wherever God leads them, and wherever he leads him, he can be content. True contentment in all places and circumstances is found only as Paul puts it, through Christ who strengthens me. So whether I have a lot or whether I have a little, whether I'm going through good economic times or whether I'm going through bad, whether my kids aren't listening to me, whether my spouse isn't listening to me, I can still find contentment. I can still find hope. In short, Paul is promising that God will supply the Philippians the ability, the ability to face all circumstances through the one who gives them strength. I want to close with this last passage and then just a little illustration. Writing to his beloved friend and co-worker Timothy, Paul said this in 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8. We've kind of already gone through this a little bit. Godliness with contentment is great gain. This is the type of wealth that the Christian must pursue. In a, about a month, um, my wife and I will be saying goodbye to our kids. Turns out that both my son and my daughter-in-law and my daughter and my son-in-law have all decided to go into missions. Now, there were uh, a few years ago, I was pretty excited about that, uh, and then they decided that they wanted to go into missions with Muslims. And I kept telling them, there's a lot of Muslims in France, you know, uh, near Paris, there's a lot of Muslims. Uh, <clears throat> there's a city in Michigan that has a lot of Muslims. Uh, and, and so, um, I, I, God's been working on the area of contentment, just being content with their life choices. And it was kind of like crazy, man, my, both, my, both, both my kids and their spouses, they're all going overseas to learn Arabic and then also to learn the Muslim culture so they can minister to this enormous population of people that God loves. God's been working through me. You know, I've, I've, I've told my wife, I said, we should have had a third or fourth kid. It would have been nice to have somebody live, you know, like two blocks down or worked at Walmart or something so we could have somebody that we, you know, that, you know, we could just go, hey, come on over. Now I have to go over, I don't know where, Timbuktu to see my grandkids. But anyway, I bring that up because God has been working in my life, my wife's life, contentment with our kids' choices and contentment that God is still in control and that God is good and that... Uh, you know, he's not going to leave us. And so I pray whatever your circumstance is, it is a tough one. This is a tough passage for a lot of us, the comparing, the complaining, the sense of entitlement. Get close to God, be thankful people, and recognize what he did on the cross for you. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you so much um, for your word. Um, it literally has been a lifesaver for me as I've just had to reckon through life circumstances. As I just deal with circumstances that are beyond my control, but certainly not beyond yours. Lord, I have my desires, and uh, more often than not, uh, I have to realign those with yours. And so I pray that each and every of uh, my friends, brothers and sisters that are out there, whatever circumstance they're in, Lord, that you would help them to learn contentment and that they would be able to trust you for every area of life. 
Thank you for your amazing word. I thank you for this day, and I just pray that as we go out today, Lord, that you would lead us into some unbelievable circumstances where we can praise you and share your unbelievable life with others. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.